Now I get to follow that, huh? Sorry about that. I was um, in a place called Carter Caves, Kentucky. Has anybody else ever been to Carter Caves, Kentucky? Yes, I didn't figure that was probably, I figured that was probably the case. But I, I was in a place called Carter Caves, Kentucky, which is exactly what it sounds like. There are hundreds and hundreds of caves in this one geographic location. Um, I'm not, I don't know all the details, how it was formed, how it, uh, I, I don't know all the details, but you just go there and you can camp there and you can, um, they have cabins there and you can go spelunking. How many of you have ever been spelunking before? Spelunking's going in exploring caves. And so our youth group went and back then they didn't seem to care about kids nearly as much as they do today. Um, and our, our youth leader was like, hey, take your flashlights and we'll meet back here in six hours. Have fun. Perfect. Perfect. So me and a buddy of mine found this little hole that was just in the ground. Just we were walking through the woods and we saw this, this opening. And we climbed down in this opening and it, it opened into this giant room, probably about the size of this auditorium. We crawled in. It was just this big kind of looks like, you know, the stalactites and stalagmites and the whole nine yards and just gorgeous. This, the water trickling down the walls and the whole nine yards. We're in there with our flashlights and we keep going. And as we go into this cave, the cave starts to get narrower and narrower and narrower. And pretty soon we're crawling like this, going like this with our flashlights. And all of a sudden it starts to get wet. So the ceiling keeps getting lower and the water keeps getting higher. That's a horrible combination in a cave. So we're crawling back through there, and we're kind of committed now. We're going, and what we didn't realize we were doing was our flashlights, as we were crawling like this, were getting in the water. And so we're crawling way back there. All of a sudden, my flashlight, flicker, 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 gone. So I'm like, Jay, my buddy Jay. I was like, Jay. And before I could say, get your flashlight out of the water, gone. So we're sitting in here now, fully committed to this cave. In the middle of it, like this, ceiling over our head, water right here. And, and when you're in, 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 in cave darkness, it's a whole nother level of darkness. It's, it's darkness that you can feel. Like, like it, it lays on you. You have, there's no light at all. And so we're sitting in there and he's like, do we go back? What do we do? And I was like, let's just sit here for a second and try to think. And we're trying to hit our flashlights to get the batteries to work again. Nothing's working. And this is a true story. Unlike most of my father-in-law's illustrations, this was actually true. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll just play. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so we're sitting there, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, as our eyes start to adjust, I'm like, is that light up there? Is that light? You know, I mean, because your eyes, it, it's so dark that any tiny little sliver of light can penetrate it, and you notice it, right? Right now, if you shine, you see all these big lights here, you don't really even notice them because it's daylight. They're not shedding I mean, you're shedding just as much light, but because there's already light, you can see the light. You know, it's not, it's not, as, as, it's not stark. But, but if you have one little sliver of light in a cave, you, you notice it. And, and, and we start looking, our eyes start adjusting, and we can see one little, little what looked like light ahead. You can see just a little tiny bit, and we're like, let's go that way. And we started making our way that way toward the light, and that light more than likely saved our lives. It was just a little sliver of sun coming through a little opening. And when we got closer, it got brighter and brighter and brighter. And we found our way out of that cave the other direction. And so, and we're thinking about this theme here of this, the, the cave and, and, and being in there and, and the light of the world. I don't know. I'm not privy. Uh, I, I guess I could be privy to, but I haven't been privy to exactly how VBS is going to work out. Other than I know the theme is Jesus is the light of the world. And, and, and I know that it didn't take a whole lot of sunlight to get into that cave to lead me to, to, to daylight. 
It just took a little sliver of light in, in the darkness that I was in to lead me out. So, um, hey, hang on. Let's talk later. Deal? We'll talk after church. No deal? Can you take us there? Take you where? To the All right, come here. Come up here. Come up here. All right. So, here's the deal. All right, you hear his question? Can, you, can we take him to the caves? We're going to do that. But you got to be here for VBS. Huh? You're welcome, Tanya. All right, so, right, and you're going to be in the caves. You are going to be in the caves, but you got to come to the VBS. Yeah, All right? Okay, perfect. There's no water in this one. But, but, but listen, but, but listen, let's talk about it right after church, and we'll handle that. All right? Thanks, man. All right, cool. All right. So, now, what, what, as we think about the theme, as you think about what Jesus or think about Jesus as being the light of the world, Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter number 7. The Feast of Tabernacles was a, was a celebratory feast, a, a, a big party, if you will. It was the most festive of all the, the Israelite feasts. And Jesus goes there in, in uh, John chapter number 7, and, and he sneaks there. He goes in. There were two things that characterized the, the atmosphere at, at the Feast of Tabernacles. First of all, well, there's several things, but the one thing that the people did was they lived in booths. It was the Feast of Booths or tents or uh, uh, temporary dwellings. And if you know anything about me, I can't stand to be in a tent. I would rather stay anywhere. I pay really good money to live in a house, and I like to sleep in that bed. But, you know, I'm just, that's me, all right? But, but during this feast... They would all make temporary booths because the feast was uh, a looking back of, of God's faithfulness as they wandered in the wilderness. That was part of the celebration. The other part of the celebration was celebrating the fact that all the harvest was in. The ingathering. It was also called the Feast of the Ingathering. All of the harvest was in, and so they were celebrating. All the hard work for the year had been done. They were celebrating, and they were waiting on the renewal of the land. So they were celebrating God's faithfulness in several different ways. One way they celebrated God's faithfulness was they would take a golden pitcher, uh, several gallons big, and the high priest would go, and he would take that golden pitcher and go to the Pool of Siloam, and he would dip that pitcher in there and take it up. And it was a big thing. And he would hold this golden pitcher up. And he would walk back to the temple court in the middle of the temple. And he would pour out the water in the temple, in the middle of the temple court. And, and, and that was the, uh, the, 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 the festival of the drawing of the water. And when, when, when he would do that, what it was, it was, a, it was recognizing... God's faithfulness through uh, the wilderness in giving them water. It was recognizing God's faithfulness in, in providing for their crops. And it was also a prayer for, uh, at, to ask God to provide water uh, for the upcoming year. Because now it's, we, we don't really think about water so much. Rain is an inconvenience for us a lot of times. But, but back then, water, and in a lot of places in the world today... It, you're thankful when the rains come. You're thankful when you have water. And so, so that's what that was. Well, Jesus in, in, in John chapter 7 says, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And so that, as, as they were dumping out that water, a lot of people believe that's where Jesus said, comes out and says out of, out of the, the shadows and says, If any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. Because Jesus is the one that satisfies our thirst. He's the one that gives us living water. He's the one that we need. He's the one that we need for our sustenance and everything else. So then that was part of the, the feast. The other part of the feast was they had a big, a big celebration of light. A, a big, how do they call it? The temple light show. The temple light show. And that sounds pretty modern, doesn't it? It sounds like a uh, Pink Floyd something or another. I don't know. But anyway... Uh, it was a temple light show. Uh, for those of you non, I guess all you non-Christians knew what I was talking about there, right? <laughs> Any, anyhow, my father-in-law taught me all about that. But there is, uh, uh, so they had this temple light show. And what they would do was, um, as, as it started to get dark during this festival at night, they would come in and they had these giant menorahs or candelabras in the court of women. In the temple, the court of women was the furthest 
place in the temple that women could go. It was a common place of worship. Everybody could worship together in a court of women. They didn't have to, but women couldn't go any further. They couldn't go up the stairs. They couldn't go any further than that particular spot. So in that, 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 that court of women, they had these, these 75-foot candelabras or menorahs, 75 feet tall. And each one had four branches off of it. So there were 16 giant branches full of gallons of oil. And they would take priests, old garments from the priest's robes that were used, that were no good anymore, and they would use those as wicks. And they would light uh, this oil and these lamps. And the whole, and the, the temple was up on the hill. Those of you that have been to Jerusalem uh, know that. I'm told that. I've never been there. But, but they said that when they would light all those at night, that you could see it for miles and miles and miles around. And they, they, they had these big ladders. They would climb up and light these giant 75-foot candles that would just burn. And they said that you could, you could do your work in the middle of town by the light of these candles. It was just an amazing show. And what they would do, once they lit the candles, they would celebrate. Because they were celebrating God's faithfulness through the wilderness as the, as the, pillar, of cloud, uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the, the pillar of fire by night that led them step by step through the wilderness. They were celebrating God's faithfulness. They were celebrating God's faithfulness in coming to the tabernacle and filling it with his Shekinah glory, the light. And they were celebrating also the fact that one day God was going to send his light into the world to, to save us all. He was going to send Messiah into the world. So they're celebrating this. And when they would celebrate this that night, they would have uh, all the, the Levitical musicians and, and, and everybody would come up and they would play songs and they would dance and they would sing and they would celebrate. It was just a big uh, uh, celebration of God's faithfulness, uh, past, present, and future. And so that's what they were doing at this festival here in John chapter 7, 8, and 9. And in John chapter 8, verse number 12, Jesus comes in and he says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, in the midst of all this, in the midst of this parting, in the midst of this celebration, in the midst of this uh, 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 amazing atmosphere of light and music and sound and, 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 and community, Jesus comes in and he says, and when he spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus pops in and boom. I can imagine in my mind's eye, one of those scenes where everybody's having a good time, the, 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 the music's going, and all of a sudden the, you hear the needle screech across the album and everything just comes to a stop, right? Who is this guy who would dare come in and make that claim? You see, guys, everything about Jesus is either, is this. He's either the Messiah or he's crazy. He didn't leave any doubt. There was nothing in between because of the things he said. He came in in the midst of all this celebration. And, and, and what they were celebrating was God going to send his light into the world in this form of a Messiah. And then Jesus steps up in the middle of that and he says, I am the light of the world. What he's saying there, without any shadow of a doubt, is I am the light that God sent into the world. I am the Messiah. I am the one. I am the one you need. I am your hope. I am the I am. Amen? That's, that's what Jesus says. And so, uh, and obviously there's a big uh, uh, fight that follows and the Pharisees get all upset and they, they, they're, they, they really want to kill him. But Jesus comes out and he says, number one, if you're thirsty, come to me. And I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you'll never walk in darkness. And the truth is, I don't know where you're at today as far as, you know, your relationship with God. But Jesus is the answer. Jesus is exactly who he said he is. And he does exactly what he says he does. He satisfies your thirst and he gives you light to live life Life can get pretty dark sometimes. Maybe you're going through a dark time right now. I, you know, you think about relationships. They're ugly. They're difficult. They're hard. Life's messy. Community's messy. Um, you think about um, 
your, your relationship with your wife or your spouse, your relationship with your spouse, and that can, get, that can get difficult. But here's the beautiful thing about following Jesus. He gives us the light to see the next step so we can just simply follow him. How many raised kids or are raising kids? What's that about? I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. I honestly have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how in the world, with these diff- three different personalities that live in our house, how in the world I can, I can raise them in a way, you know, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I, I, how do you do that? I've seen parents that I thought were amazing have kids that turned out to be horrible. I mean, no offense. I, none of you. It's none of you. It's none of you. Um, but I've also seen parents that I thought weren't that great and their kids turned out to be amazing. You know what? I have no idea. But I do know this. Jesus gives me light enough to see my path so I can take another step. I can go a little further. It doesn't need to be a whole lot of light. I just need to see right in front of me to take the next step. And Jesus does that as we follow him. He is truly the light of the world. He's what we need. He's what we uh, long for. He's our Savior. Now, the cool thing about that is, after all the argument in John chapter number 9, check this out. So you have, you have Jesus coming in during the, during the feast and, and the water's poured out and Jesus stands up and says, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. They have the light celebration. Jesus comes in and says, I am the light of the world. Then after all that, as everything's winding down, he comes and he does this. Verse number one of chapter nine, he says, as he went along, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. This guy that can't see anything. That's cave darkness. That's dark, dark. That's, that's, that's no hope darkness, right? As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, this is an interesting question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned? Whose fault is it that he's born blind? And Jesus' answer is amazing. And this might be the answer to what you're going through too, honestly. You ever ask the why is this going on question? Why me? Why this? Why now? Why my kid? Why my parents? Why this? Jesus says in verse number three, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Amen? Think about that. He went through all that so that, that, that the works of God may be displayed in him. Verse number four, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Then he says this, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Right? So you got a man born blind. Why is he born blind? So that the works of God could be shown through him. Then watch Jesus say, he reiterates the fact that I am the light of the world. Then what does he do? After saying this, he spit on the ground. A little, little different. A little different. He spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, that's, that's, uh, that's odd. That's different. I, that probably wouldn't be my preferred method of healing if I had the ability. Right? But he spits on the ground. And he makes mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes. After saying, in verse number seven, go, he told him, wash where? In the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. What had they just done in the pool of Siloam? They got the water out in the golden pitcher from the pool of Siloam to go and dump it out to signify God's faithfulness in providing, in in, in guiding, in, in, in saving them in the wilderness. So he sends them to the pool there. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So he sent him to the pool uh, 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 that, that was just representing God's faithfulness. He washes in there and then he opens his eyes and he can see the light of the world. Amen? So he perfectly illustrates in person what that feast represented, proving that Jesus is indeed our Messiah. Amen? So... So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. Verse number 8, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, 
isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. He said, I don't know. So in that, as our kids are going to be in VBS this week, as they're going to be learning about the light of the world, think about Jesus in your life. Think about the light that Jesus has given to you. Think about the the miracles that he's done to you. Think about how he's proven time and time again that he's exactly who he said he is. He is the light of the world. He is who we need. He is our answer. He is our hope. Amen? And I don't know about you, but as I live my life and and, and know what I'm capable of, and as I look in the mirror and, and see who's looking back at me, it blows me away that Jesus decided to show me his light and give me that little sliver that led me to the great light, that led me to safety, that led me to eternal life. He saved my life. He is my Messiah. He is my Savior, and I love him dearly. And listen, it's not about going to church. It's not about being this. It's not about not doing that. It's not about any of that. It's about you looking to the light and saying, I want you. You're what I need. Amen? He is the light of the world. We need Jesus, period. Amen? So what we're going to do this morning in closing, as we close this thought, is this. We're going to celebrate quietly the light who has come into the world. We beheld his glory. His body was broken and his blood was shed so that we could see it too. Amen? And we're going to celebrate that through what we call communion. So what, the way we do it on Family Sundays is we have four tables. We have two tables up here, two tables in the back. And what we're going to do here is we're all going to take communion together. So we're going to get up and you walk to the back. You walk up here and you get, your, you get the elements. You get the, the juice, which represents the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And you get the bread, which signifies the broken body of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do, we're going to come together. Maybe it's with your family. Maybe you want to do it by yourself. Maybe you want to do it uh, with some friends. Maybe uh, you want to invite somebody into your circle. However you want to do it. Come and get the elements here in just a minute after we pray. And you go. And let's think about this as we partake in communion. How, what has Jesus done for me to help me see his light? and be thankful for that. I shook someone's hand earlier today. I said, how are you doing? And they looked at me and they said, grateful. And that should be our posture now as we come to the Lord's table. We're thankful. We're grateful for the light that has been shown to us so that we can know him. Amen? Balcony, you're going to do it a little differently. You're going to stay put. It's a little tough, a little tough getting back and forth up there. We have a couple of servers up there, I believe. We have some servers up there. Yes, thank you. And, and we're going we're gonna to bring it to you, okay? So you just sit tight and we'll bring that to you. But let's quietly celebrate the light who has come into the world and saved us and, and, and is going to bring us, uh, and has reconciled us to the Father so that we can be with him forever and ever and ever. Amen? The only Father, Lord, as we come before you in a room full of, of people who are looking to you, Lord, if there be somebody here who doesn't know you, who is is just maybe searching, is just maybe thinking these things through, God, we asked that as I was in that cave with my friend and it was so dark and you sent that little sliver, we saw that little sliver of light that led us out of the darkness. God, we just asked that you would break through the strongholds and send light the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ into their lives. Help them to see you. And God, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we partake of communion, as we celebrate the fact that on the cross you made it possible for us to be reconciled, for us to see the light. You went through that so we could see the light. God, help us to quietly celebrate in reverent awe of what you've done for us with grateful hearts. 
Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for your body being broken for me. I don't deserve it at all. God, but you chose to come down and do it for us, to do it for me, to save me. I'm dirty. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm filthy. I'm a rebel. But yet you saved me. And you did that for us. Help us to be the light of the world as you shine through us. And God, help us as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Feel free to move about. If you're, whichever table you're closest to, go partake in the elements and celebrate the Lord until he comes.